All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. On this episode, our special guest is Daniela Rogul. Daniela is a Croatian-American journalist and reporter who moved from California to Croatia, where she now covers soccer or football for the rest of the world, or Nogomet for us. Uh, she live, or She's live now, I'm reading, she lives now in Qatar. She's live now in Qatar, <laughs> <laughs> where she's covering the Croatian matches. And in this episode, we're going to learn a little bit more about her and hear firsthand how the World Cup is going in Qatar and how the Croatian team looks. Uh, Daniela, thanks for coming on the podcast. Of course. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, you know, we were just talking off camera about Qatar and everything, how the whole setup is. And I'm really interested to learn more about that. But before we get into that, um, you know, you also have a really interesting story about yourself. So you're born in born and raised in Southern California. Is that right? Yeah, born and raised, born and raised in San Diego. Um, lived there until I was 17, until I graduated high school and went to university and then moved to San Francisco and lived there for almost seven years. Um, and then things kind of developed and I was in Nashville for a bit, then London for a bit, and then ultimately split. But um, yeah, both my parents are Croatian, were born in Croatia. My mom's from Metković. My dad was born in Split. My grandma from uh, Stadigrad on Hvar, my grandfather from a small village um, above Trogir called Prapatnica. So grew up very Dalmatian, especially very, very Dalmatian household. Um, and uh, luckily, a lot of my most of my dad's family moved from Croatia to um, to the States. So I grew up with a kind of large Croatian uh, family. Um, growing up in San Diego, in Southern California. So was lucky to have that. So Croatia was never too far out of sight. And obviously we visited every summer as much as we could. Um, and yeah, now I live in Split. I've uh, been, been in Split <laughs> for crazy, totally on accident, by accident that happened. I had no plan um, to live in Croatia. Obviously for me, it was my summer place. I had never stayed in Croatia in the autumn or the winter or the spring. I'd only ever seen Croatia in the summer, uh, but I came back to get my citizenship, of course, and got back quite quickly in a couple of weeks. My parents had just come back to retire, to split to retire. And I obviously had these big plans like, oh great, now I have my EU citizenship. I'm gonna go to Berlin. I'm gonna go anywhere but Croatia. Um, but that was the summer of 2015 when Split kind of experienced, and I say this a lot, but it was just kind of like new renaissance. There were new new bars, new places to go out, different restaurants, more international, wine bars, et cetera. And Split really had this different vibe than what I was used to when we would visit, when it was really just this kind of port city. Uh, so my parents convinced me to stay. And so I stayed. Um, and gave up my hope of living in Berlin or anywhere else. <laughs> and best decision I ever made. Um, got a job, great job, about six months later, working with Total Croatian News. And um, I had actually gone to university to study journalism, uh, political journalism, so slightly different. Um, and uh, so in a way, <clears throat> my life kind of came full circle when I moved to Croatia. Then I, 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 like I came back to the homeland to do actually what I had set out to do um, in uni. Um, and at first I was writing more about travel and split and lifestyle and whatnot uh, with Total Croatian News. And what I really wanted was to write about football. That was always my dream. I played for, uh, got over a decade. My grandfather was a referee. My dad was a coach. My brother was a player. Football can completely uh -huh. consumed my family. So um, at that time, Total Creation News already had somebody writing about football and specifically High Duke, which is my team. Um, and after he left, then I took over as the sports editor and then started uh, following the Croatian national team and all Croatian football, uh, in addition to other Croatian sport. And um, I've been doing that now since 2016, 17. I've been um, writing about sport in Croatia and it's taken me to a lot of places, including Qatar for the World Cup. So here I am. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. If you look back yeah. I mean, before you moved to Croatia, what was it, seven, seven years seven ago? Years ago. Yeah. If you would have thought, you know, Seven years later, you'd be living in Croatia. You're in Qatar for the World Cup covering it. What would you have thought? 
No way that you could not have. I would have not believed you for a second. I, I, I swear. And I say that all the time. You know, America, everybody says, you know, America is the land of opportunity. I truly do not believe I could have achieved what I have um, here in America. I don't think I would have, um, which is interesting because. I think it's good to be in Croatia with an American work ethic. I think that's really important because I do think that that helps. And obviously we are very persistent here. And um, once you have your heart set on something, um, especially me, I don't like to be told no. And I will never forget um, before I had applied for to cover my first Croatian national team match, I had a colleague at the time um, and I was asking, you know, how do, how do I apply? You know, how do I apply for press? At that point, I had no idea. And he's like, don't even bother. You'll never get a press pass. Hmm. And that motivated me beyond belief. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? I'm not going to get a press pass. Okay. So of course I apply and I get a press pass for my first match. And I think that was Croatia, Kosovo, a qualifier, European qualifier. Um, but it was, I'm so grateful to that colleague because um, that had kind of paved the way for me to say, you know what, I, I can do this. I can, number one, be a football journalist. I can be a female football journalist in Croatia. And I know it can take me places as long as I put my, you know, put my heart to it. And like I said, it has, because I'm in Qatar now for the World Cup. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, sometimes yeah. that's the best motivation, you know, from oh, other people sure. like that. For sure, yeah. for sure. And actually, I do actually, I want to ask about Canada a little bit and their coach and what they said, because, you know, that's sort of a similar situation. But yeah. before that, I want to backtrack just for a second. Uh, yep. Did you say that you got your citizenship in a few weeks? Oh, my gosh. Well, a few <laughs> weeks. Yes. A few weeks when I came to Croatia, about uh, a year. It took about a year before that trying to do it outside of Croatia. Oh, uh, OK. OK. Yeah. But once I came, once I came to Croatia and this was 2015, so I know the rules have changed since then. All we did, my mom and I went to MOOP. Um, I just had to show their paperwork. And obviously I had everything else done, like the apostle and all of that stuff. Um, literally two weeks, I had my ID card and passport. Wow. After a year of going to like the consulate in London and calling it, you know, the embassy in America and LA and whatnot. Oh my gosh. Then here it was like done. <laughs> so it's not that easy anymore. I hear, I hear it's a bit more difficult now to get your citizenship, but apparently, yeah, I applied, I think around six months ago, I'm still waiting, but I mean, we'll see anything under a year. I'll be happy. Yeah. Anything under a year. My friend, my girlfriend um, back in California, she just got hers I think it took 10 months and she yeah, did that all the states so you know uh, you might you might get lucky you might get it a bit there's, hope. there's hope yeah. <laughs> there's hope trust me there's hope <laughs> uh, well Daniela let me ask you a little bit um as a reporter as a journalist what exactly are you um doing you know are you close to the field do you talk with the players do you um write articles about the game do you interview the ask questions, you know, in the interview room after the game, sort of what's your sort of day-to-day -day in that uh, context? So here, well, it's been actually a bit interesting since I've been here because I haven't, I'm staying about 40 minutes-ish from actually like the center of Doha. So it's been a bit tough. Um, I really feel like I've been in the on the bus. We have media transport and I've been on that more than um, anything, I think at this point. But um so far as covering Croatia, the, there's a press conference before each um, before each match, the day before each match, and that's always Dalic and a player. So those are the big ones to go to because those are obviously 24 hours before kickoff. And, um, you know, people ask questions about, let's say, the lineup. Um, what can we expect? Obviously, they don't like to give away too much for obvious reasons. Uh, but those are always the most important press conferences, I think, to attend. Um, and those are held at the main media center, which is where all the media activities have been running um, for, for journalists in Qatar. So that that's kind of our hub of everything. Um, during the matches, I write live. So I cover the matches live, which comes with a lot of anxiety. And <laughs> it's tough when you're also a fan, you know, and then you're just sitting there like you, you want to watch and enjoy, but you're like, no, I have to write and actually like take care of business. Um, but I've also, I think it was a lot tougher for me doing it five years ago than now. Now I've really learned how to, you know, kind of, okay, take a step back. This Not every little small detail needs to be written about. We can kind of observe and and, um, and summarize certain parts. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so those games, um, all games I write about live and publish the results the second, you know, the final whistle blows. Um, after the games, we have a mix zone and that's with the players. So that is where journalists can ask questions. So um, FIFA is doing it a bit differently this year, actually, or this time around. Um, right as soon as the game is done, we go to this mix zone area and they send three players right off the pitch. Um, and that they come and speak to you. So the other day after the Croatia Canada game, we had Gvardiol, Petkovic, and Mayer came and spoke to us um, immediately. And so there, there's a bunch of journalists there. Uh, you know, so everybody's asking questions. Everybody has their phone out and recording. Uh, and then if you wait about 30 to 40 minutes, you can get the rest of the players. So um, this is after they've showered. This is after, you know, they're all clean, la, la, la. Um, so Modric stopped the other day um, for what well, he said, just one short question. Um, uh, he's usually great though. Modric is actually loves talking to everybody. Um, Lovren stopped for a little bit. Pedisic stopped for a little bit. Um, but just to, as the team has to kind of, you know, also run on schedule, um, you know, we have to respect that and try not to bombard them with too much. This is the mm -hmm. world cup after all. Uh, and then, um, we can as well go to training sessions, Croatia's training sessions. Media has the right to see about 15 minutes of the training sessions, uh, obviously there's not much to see in the first 15 minutes. It's usually just the warm up. Um, but you'll kind of see who, if any players injured, um, and, and things like that, if anybody's maybe in question, um, and are maybe training separately and things like that. So things that journalists would be interested in going into a game. Uh, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been busy. There's a lot, there's a lot going on here, a lot going on here. And now, so do you know, um, are you, I mean, I won't say like friends with the players, but I mean, are you in contact with the players before? I mean, before Qatar, I'm sure the Hajduk players, you probably have spoken no. with more often than the other players. Um, no, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm a bit shy and I think it's, um, I think part of me is like, you know, uh, that wh why do they want to talk to another journalist? You know, it's just like that kind of thing inside. I'm like, like, give them their space, you know? Um, obviously a lot of the other journalists are very aggressive. Um, and I tried to not be that, you know, I kind of want to be like, okay, if it feels right, I'll feel out the situation and then we can speak. And if not, they have too much on their plate, you know? Um, so no, I would not say I'm in contact with players. Um, I would don't think I would like to be. I think I would like to maintain that respect and kind of let them do their job. I don't mm -hmm. think they need another journalist on their back. I'll put it that way. <laughs> they yeah, have well, yeah, that's a, definitely a tough balance. I mean, you have to ask yeah. questions, and but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, ask questions that you know are going to cause a reaction that they don't want to yeah. hear or that I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's definitely it's a tough job. Of course, of course. And um. You know, before off camera, we were talking a little bit about um, sort of expectations going into Qatar and, you know, were you nervous at all? What sort of expectations did you have before you arrived? And now that you're here, what is it like? Yeah, so I am so surprised by how incredible everything has been here. Um, as we were saying before, I must have read every blog, every article on the planet um, coming into Qatar and I was petrified. Like part of me was quite scared, you know, to the point where, you know, I was messaging my friends and, you know, saying things like, I'm going to check in with you every day. Um, and, you know, just, just obsessing over things like the rules and the, the proper etiquette and the attire and this and that. And since from the second I arrived, um, I have not been in a more helpful, encouraging environment. Um, safe. I've never been, I swear, I've never traveled to somewhere safer. Um, it is a, and, and that's the thing I've received so many messages to like, be careful, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, like I, I, before I left, I thought the same thing, you know, and then I'm here, I'm like, wow, this is literally the safest place. And you'll hear that from everybody. This isn't just me. Um, I was sitting down this morning. Um, I had coffee and some, uh, two Qatari residents actually originally from Tunisia, that have lived in Qatar for a long time, they invited me to sit with them, and two older men in their maybe their 50s. And we were speaking about all of this and they were talking about the safety in Qatar. And um, you know, they're like, you could leave your mobile phone anywhere and somebody will return it to you. Like they, like you are so safe 
everywhere. Nobody will pickpocket. Nobody will steal anything. Everybody's here to help. And um, as we were talking a bit before as well, the hospitality is second to none. Uh, from your barista to your bus driver, to your security guard, to just a random local on the street, everyone is genuinely there to help you. And they'll do it with a smile. Um, I thought Americans were good at hospitality. This brings things to a completely different level. Uh, everyone is so open. Their hearts are so full. Um, and I, I really have not, I don't remember the last time I was in such a helpful environment. And I, I'm not just saying that I truly, truly mean it. Um, so Qatar has completely gone above and beyond my expectations. And that was from the second I landed. I've been here now a week, over a week, a little over a week. Uh, and it's just continued to get better. And organizationally, I have to say, yes, I am media. So the tournament is slightly different from my perspective. Uh, but organizationally, this World Cup is uh, like flawless. It's so efficient. Um, media is obviously very well taken care of. But I've spoken to a lot of fans as well that are having a great time. And um, after each match, there's hundreds and hundreds of buses lined up to take fans back to their accommodation or back to the metro or this or that. So everybody's getting around with ease. Um, it really seems like everyone's having a good time. So huh. don't believe everything the media tells you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's sort of, you know, different than what the narrative is right now in yeah. the media. And another narrative that they're talking about, or they were talking about at first, was the beer. I wanted to ask, are you able to, is there any beer over there? There's loads. No, that's great. Yeah. They, yeah, if you have the time to drink, you can. Um, I have not, but there is actually, there's a bar in the media center. We have a bar in the media center. Um, the, every hotel has a bar so you can go and drink. Um, I've been watching Insta stories, Instagram stories from people from the States that are here. And I swear every day they've been at a different place partying, whether it's a cruise <laughs> ship or this or that. Um, there are parties every night and I get um I get notifications or SMS messages on my phone there are so many different clubs here and music festivals happening that don't start until you know midnight and go until 6 a.m and they have international be beverages starting from you know eight euros or something so it's not like you cannot find alcohol here <laughs> um obviously you have to respect the culture and respect all of that but if you needed to find a drink it's not difficult um and trust me people are going and finding it i definitely know the croatians are um as our <laughs> most as our most national fan national team fans you know so uh -huh. that is not difficult <laughs> well and it sounds I, like it's I, yeah gone <laughs> i'm sorry it sounds like it's more than just football too you said um, there's parties there's clubs and music festivals going on it's crazy i mean like just just before our call i had um two text messages of two different events happening, um, one tonight, one tomorrow. Um, and it, you know, they tell, it's like you're in the States, you know, it's like you get a message from a club, like ladies, this price, international beverages, this price, come hang out with these DJs until this time. Um, and that's happening every night, every single night. And like I said, I haven't had time to partake, uh, but I have spoken to people, especially there have been uh, a lot of people have been here for the last month or so setting up. Um, with different broadcast teams or part of the organization. So they've obviously had time to get to um, get to know some of the locals better or get to go out a bit more. And they've been they've been out every single night. You know, there's a different party every night to go to. Um, so I have options, you know, I just I just <laughs> haven't gotten there yet. I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know if I will, but um, yeah, I would not um, it's not that difficult to to find things to do. Huh, interesting. Yeah, it's nice to hear from a firsthand source, you know, what's sort of going on over there. And another okay. another a sort of a bone I have to pick is I've been hearing the narrative that it's so hot over there, you know, players won't be able to play, blah, blah, blah. And I find out it's like 28, 29 degrees yeah. Celsius over there. Yeah, it's literally 28, 29. And yesterday or the day before it was 30, 31. No, the day before yesterday, it was 31. That was the hottest day we have had since I've been here. And I arrived on November 22nd. Also, the air cons are blasting like crazy. And so if anything, people should be more concerned about everyone getting sick, you know, from <laughs> uh, from the air cons. And it's so funny because you see so many journalists now 
blowing their noses and sneezing. And I think everybody's really gotten sick from, from the air con. Um, but no, it's, it's pleasant. It's so pleasant here. The weather's perfect. Um, I've, I, it's kind of like dream weather, you know, I haven't sweat yet, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. You know how it, how it gets in Croatia in the summer. We're like dying. This is super pleasant. Um, really, really good weather. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I was thinking 28, 29 is like, that's not oh, that hot. Beautiful. I was in the whole month of February. I went back to Los Angeles uh, from uh-huh. Croatia and it, for like five days in a row, it was 35 over there yeah. in February. And I'm, and so I'm like, I mean, if, if the World Cup was supposed to be in the summer, it's going to be at least that hot, probably more. Of course. Right. Of course. Absolutely. And honestly, I yeah, it takes time for the for the players to acclimate, you know, like, of course, that a lot of them look at the ones playing in the Premier League where it's been cold there for a while mm-hmm. or anyone playing in other other parts of the world where it's where it's chillier. But I think everybody kind of got used to it quite quickly. You know, um, I know there was a lot of media buzz those first couple days like the play. It's so hot for the players. Like, what are they going to do? They can't adapt. Um, I don't think that's an issue. I think everyone has adapted. Um, like Croatia moved their trainings to the evening, you know, like there's so many things you can do to, to, to make it work. And honestly, it's been very enjoyable. I will say the weather's been super nice. Ah, Glad to hear. Let's talk about the team a little bit. Uh, I sort of mentioned the Canadian coach and everything, you know, what he said, everyone knows what he said. We're going to F Croatia. And that was a big, you know, narrative in the media. And of course us in the Aspera and all, all the Croatian fans, you know, got so heated. Is that something yeah. that you think the team actually like gets mad about and that really motivated them? Or is that something, you know, people say that that happens, people trash talk and it's not a really a big deal to the team. Or do you think that's actually, you know, they felt similar to how we did? No, I think they did. I think they did feel a bit similar. Um, I know Kramaric in his post game um, interview, he came out and said, thank you to the Can- to the Canada coach, you know, because that did motivate us. And uh, I think Dalic as a coach has always preached so much about respecting other national teams and, and and getting that in return. And so to hear that from your next opponent, you know, we're going to F Croatia. I mean, for Dalic, that, that stung, you know, because he's so big on respect. And um, so, of course, that motivated. Of course, that motivated them. Um I think especially, like I said, especially Kramaric, who then came out and scored two goals, you know, and, and I think he couldn't uh-huh. wait until that post-match interview where he could say, ah, oh, you know, look at, look at who left whom, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I definitely, definitely think that the players and the fans shared the same sentiment in that. Ah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And I think I saw Dalic in one of his, one of the post um, press conferences said something that that's only happened twice before. I think against Argentina and then against Canada that um, that the coach didn't shake his hand after the game or something like that. Yeah. Which I loved Dalich's response as well. You know, he was like, yeah, that was the second time that's happened to him. Uh, He's like, but you know, the coach, the coach is still young. He's like, he'll learn it eventually, you know, (laughs) and it's true. It does. It takes experience. Like, look, this is the first time Canada qualified in how long? I mean, they this is an international stage they've never been on, you know, and people get heated and obviously emotions run high, you know, but there's also class that you have to show and there's composure that you have to show and respect that you have to show. And I think Dalich is right in saying, you know, he'll learn, he'll learn eventually. And I'm, I'm sure he will. <laughs> yeah. That's like the best response you can give too. you know, you're not insulting yeah. someone, but at the same time, you know, you're, yeah. You're being the the better the better man, I guess you can say, the bigger Absolutely. person. Absolutely. Um. Now I want to ask you if you can for sort of the keys. Well, before we get into that, I'll ask. I mean, how do you think we look right now as a team, chemistry wise <laughs> and you know playing wise? Look, I think it's it's taken a little bit. Um, I think it's taken a little bit for Croatia as it has for most national teams to find their rhythm. Uh, the Croatia that we saw against Morocco is not a Croatia I ever want to see again. You know, I think that was a very, uh, I think obviously playing at 1 PM, I think was a disadvantage. Uh, I think Croatia looked like they were playing for a draw. I think we also underestimated Morocco. And I also think Morocco was just great, you know? Um, 
And I think that game, I'm so happy we had that game because I think it was the wake up call for Croatia to say, okay, here we are. We are at the World Cup. We need to show the real Croatia. And that was the big, um, that was the big kind of theme and message at the press conference before the game against Canada. And Petisic was really, really vocal about that. He said that what you saw against Morocco was not us, you know? Um, and so I think we're grateful to have had that experience because now it seems like with this game against Canada, Croatia really began to find their rhythm again. We were playing offensively like we were used to. We were playing on the wings like we were used to. Um, Petisic was great, you know. Um, obviously, Kramaric, tournament player, scored two huge goals. Um, I think having Livaya as the striker as well and having Kramaric on the right, like that was such an incredible combination. So when all these little things kind of started pe being pieced together and and the team started finding their rhythm. Um, so I think right now Croatia looks good, uh, but the real test, as everyone has said, will be against Belgium. Uh, so if Croatia can obviously replicate this, I think we're in a good position coming into this tournament. I, I had another interview with talk sport, quite a, quite a big, um, sports radio station in the UK. And they were asking how far do you think Croatia will go? And I said, my goodness, like on paper, you know, coming off this successful nations league campaign, um, this team is 10 times better than we were, you know, coming into the, the 2018 World Cup. Uh, we barely qualified, you know, for the 2018 World Cup. Um, so on paper and looking at it, I would say we should not, we should get to at least the quarterfinal. You know, I, I would be happy with that, but I, I think technically we should probably go further. You know, obviously we're Croatian fans at the end of the day as well. Um, but I think it will really depend on this, this game against Belgium. And I think we are quite lucky that Belgium doesn't look too great right now. And it seems like their the atmosphere within their team is not great. Um, but it does seem that the atmosphere within Croatia it is. And it really seems like the senior players are showing their experience and bringing in the younger players. Um, um, and um, hopefully we can replicate, if not be better than Russia 2018. But we'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm hoping for that, of course, too. Um, well, yeah, Are Belgium, we all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. But yeah, Belgium, I mean, either didn't look too strong or Morocco was actually, you know, really underestimated, but it, it would seem that we should be able to beat Belgium. I think so. Um, I I think there's a lot in our favor in, in going into that match. And like I said, I think obviously the kind of disarray that is happening within the Belgium team um, will probably work in our favor. And I think that there is so much that comes into comes into play when you speak about, you know, the atmosphere within a team. And I know that that was such a big thing for Croatia in 2018 was that the team was just so close and everybody was so positive and there was this euphoria going on in Croatia and that kind of drove the players. And if the atmosphere within the team isn't good, you can't, it's hard to replicate, you know, good play on the, on the pitch. So, um, if things are going as badly as um, as we are hearing about in the media with Belgium, I think Croatia definitely has um, has a couple of things in their favor apart from just good football. Mm -hmm. So let's see. I mean, at the end of the day, it is still De Bruyne, and like you know, when you when you name these players, you think, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> we're going against Belgium. But let's see. Yeah, we will see. Um, I, I want to ask Daniela if you can give us sort of two different levels of breakdown looking ahead to, um, you know, the future and the next, I don't want to jump the gun, but, you know, hopefully we beat Belgium and continue on. If we want to get deep in the tournament, can you give us sort of the keys to going far in the World Cup? One on like a technical strategy analysis, you know, that I'm sure you're used to writing about. And then one on sort of a lesser analysis for like the casual fan that maybe only tunes in during the World Cup, sort of in simpler terms, you know, what Croatia needs to do. Um, I'll say, so technically, I think Croatia needs to stick to their play that we, that really helped us through the Nations League. And that is playing our wings, which are super quick. You know, you have Juranovic and Sosa um, as the, on the left and right. And every time they get a ball into the box, it's, it's, it seems as if we score. So I would say technically we need to continue playing those wings and relying on those players to get a good ball in. Uh, because that was our kind of trump card during the Nations League. And that was, you know, going against teams like France, you know, <laughs> and Denmark. So 
I think that would be our strong suit. Obviously, um, oh, let's see, to simplify, my goodness. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't even know how I would simplify it. Um, could you repeat, sorry, could you repeat the question on how on what I should simplify? Just uh, sort of the keys to Croatia going deep in this World Cup. Okay, so okay, so I can really simplify it. Um, the key would be obviously to keep a positive atmosphere within the national team. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think being led by Luka Modric, that's quite. Um, I think we can expect that. Um, and uh, let's say I'll say because I am a High Duke fan, Levaya scoring um, it will be a key. <laughs> to Levaya and Kramaric continuing to score, I think, will be a key to us going further for sure. Great. Yeah, that was a lot simpler for, for me to understand. There There you go. There you go. Yeah. As someone who still calls it soccer. Now I, oh, <laughs> I can no, you got to change that. You know, I stopped doing that. I stopped doing that yeah. a while ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I never call it soccer anymore. I actually get quite embarrassed calling it soccer. But my field is different. I am a football journalist, so I have to call it football. You know, it's it's totally different. That's true. Yeah. For me, it depends who I'm talking to. If I know someone's an American, right. I'll say it. But if yeah, I know yeah. it's from anywhere else, then I'll maybe I'll drop a soccer, but I'll do like a, a slash, you know, like soccer yeah, no, slash that's, football. That's <laughs> what I do. I like put it in parentheses. I'm like, you know, football. Oh, you know, I mean, I mean, soccer, you know, you always put it in parentheses. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I sort of have one last question for you um, that I also feel like I'm jumping the gun with this because it implies we're going to beat Belgium. And of course, you know, I don't want to underestimate any opponent. But looking yeah. ahead to sort of the next round, we would face, if we beat Belgium, we would face the um, second place of the group with Japan, Germany, Spain. out here, Spain. and Spain. Um, So our basically our three contenders are, are, are Spain, Germany, and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, Dalich would love to face Japan. Uh, he said that in his interview yesterday. Um. Why is that? I, I think he likes the way they play. I think it would be an interesting match. Um, hmm. Also, I think Croatia should win, but I don't think Dalic would say that. Um, I think facing Spain, I just have trauma because I was at the the Euros last year. And obviously Spain kicked us out in the round of 16 um, in extra time. And so I don't want to face Spain in a round of 16 again. <laughs> I just think if we can avoid Spain by all costs, great. Uh, Germany would be an interesting opponent. I don't remember the last time we played Germany. Um, they're also a bit iffy right now. Um, and like I said, I think that in, during this tournament, it is just taking a lot of teams a bit longer to, to find their rhythm. You know, like I, like I said before, they're coming from the middle of the club season they're coming into different temperatures, you know, they're, they're forced to try to figure everything out for the largest tournament in the world with a week of preparations. So I do think after this round, or in, even in this last round of games here, this last round of group games, we will start seeing um, the teams kind of coming together a bit better. But uh, I think Japan would be great if we can get Japan. Um, but let's see. Let let's see. see. Yeah. We, have, we got it. We got it. I think a draw is good enough against Belgium but that also depends on other games so you know uh, really like, but a draw could get us through we have to look. well it depends on what happens in Canada Morocco you know like there can every and every group has been having these upsets and surprises mm. so I'm really trying to stay humble you know and say okay I'm not going to try to jump the gun you know um just because there's been so there have been so many surprises this tournament um and yeah I think predictions are just good everybody's predictions are going out the window at this point yeah, sort of. It seems like anything can happen this World Cup, which is exciting. It's exciting <laughs> which for the is fans. Exciting. Absolutely, it is. It is, and I have to say, yeah, that's um, it's keeping everyone on their toes. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now I yeah. lied. Actually, I one last question before I let All you right. go. I know we have a hard All stop right. coming up here in about a minute. I know. I know. Um, but do you think this will be Luka Modric's last time with the national team? Last World Cup. Last World Cup, yes. Last time, no. And I will tell you why it's not his last time with the national team, because uh, we obviously are in the final four of the Nations League, which um, is happening next June. And Croatia has never played in that before. And I think Luka is going to want the chance to get if we can get a good result there. That's obviously another thing that he could win or get a medal in. 
Um, so I think he'll definitely stay through next summer. After that, I can't say. Um, I know he's always said he's available and open to the national team as long as he's needed. Uh, up until now, he has been needed. <laughs> you know, it's like we've just always needed Luca. Um, but, you know, there are so many good young kids now on this team. Uh, it'll take some time to fill his shoes, you know, but I am hopeful. I am hopeful. Hopefully, my goodness, by the next World Cup, we'll have a new Luca. But yes, this, this should be his next World Cup or last World Cup because he'd be what 41 yeah I think 41 huh <laughs> you know that's like crazy. that's that's not easy that's not easy <laughs> for anyone uh so let's be a little bit realistic I know we want him to to live forever and play forever but yeah we have to give the light to new players as well so yeah well of course we're all, all the fans are hoping for a little bit more from him but yeah I yes. mean <laughs> ultimately it's up to him and you know his body and and the national team and what everyone wants to do uh, Daniela, I'll let you go now. I know you've got um, other things to do. And actually, my uh, time here is running out. So I'll okay, end this right. right now. But thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. And I really appreciate you. your input and, you know, firsthand experience of what, what's going on over there. Thank you so much for having me. This was a pleasure. I'll keep you posted about how things go.